How's it going? Yeah, everything is good. How how you are doing? I do pretty well. It's a good day. Firstly, thank you for accepting my invitation and accepting to be on my show. No worries. I'm excited for this conversation. I've gone through your profile and I came to know that uh, uh, you are a yoga therapist, holistic yoga therapist. So I thought to tell about you uh, to my audience and to the world uh, who is watching and who is listening to me. Yeah, I would love that. Not very many people know about yoga therapists. It's a pretty young profession. So the more people that know, the happier I am. So before that, can you please introduce yourself to my audience? Yeah, for sure. I'm Naya and I mean, I live currently in Toronto, Canada. My family is from originally from the province of Sindh before India was partitioned. So my grandparents were refugees um, and became Indian citizens. I was born actually in Bahrain. So was my mom. And so we have a long history, both sort of in India and then in the Middle East. And then my parents moved to Canada when I was 13. So I could go to a good university. Um, and I've been here ever since. I've been practicing yoga in some shape or form since I was probably about 13. And in my mid 20s, I decided I wanted to actually do a formal teacher training to deepen my practice because I had injured myself quite a few times. So shoulder injuries, all kinds of other not fun stuff um, from practicing sort of a very Western asana focused kind of yoga. And so I did a teacher training, really loved teaching. Um, but didn't like teaching in sort of that large corporate studio style of yoga where it's 50 people, you don't know their names, <laughs> you sort of hope what you're giving them works for them. Um, so in 2019, I started my yoga therapy training, which is a thousand hours of training, kind of like a master's degree. I'm almost finished. Um, and yeah, that's really been my work. I love it so much. I get to work with people one on one. It's very much about helping meet their goals and not just a generic one size fits all practice. So I want to I want to start with the line that I have seen in your website. Truth is <laughs> truth is truth, truth is me. Something like that. <laughs> I'm wondering where you saw this now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is yeah. sort of the principal tenets of yoga, right? Like we are we are ultimately all, you know, some form of universal energy. We're all the same. And that that understanding is what yoga works to help us achieve. So whether that's through a better connection with ourselves and our bodies, with our breath and our minds, and then once you're comfortable in yourself, then you're hopefully happier and better able to sort of be in relationship with other people, but also be in relationship with your environment because you recognize that you're not separate and you're not alone, um, which I think is for many people sort of that root cause of suffering is that sense of I'm alone, no one understands me, everything is, you know, it's all my weight to bear, um, that recognition that you are the same as the whole universe um, in some ways makes it easier, but also <laughs> in some ways makes it harder because you realize that all the terrible things that are happening are all happening to the same energetic system that you're in. So it promotes better social relations. So you already completed post-graduation uh, in this subject. So I want to, I want to know what uh, made you to come into uh, this, what, who inspired you and uh, what made you to uh, study this subject? So I started yoga therapy because I've lived for most of my life with chronic pain. It runs in my, like all the women in my family have some sort of chronic pain, which is pretty hard to live with. As a kid, I had really bad joint pain, so much so that there were you know days at a time that I couldn't sleep. It made going to school really hard because when you can't sleep, everything else sort of falls apart. Um, and I remember my childhood, like parts of it were very, very lovely. You know, thanks mom and dad. I'm not, this is not on you. Um, but there are parts of it that are pretty terrible because of just how much everything hurt. And so when I started practicing yoga, I found that it was easier to be in my body as not a place of pain all of the time. It was sort of nice to be able to be curious and to explore what was possible. And that sense of sort of being comfortable in a place where I'd never been comfortable and frankly is the only home any of us ever really have um, was really, it was a really lovely experience. And I wanted one day to sort of be able to give that back. And so when I started university, I was like, oh, I'm going to be a doctor. I want people to have this experience. I clearly didn't go to med school. 
<laughs> which is fine. Um, and I realized as I continued to practice yoga over my life that this was sort of the healing path that I wanted to be able to offer people. And I've had many, many wonderful teachers over the course of my practice. My current teachers are both yoga therapists who studied with um, Desi Gachar in the, li- in the lineage of Krishnamacharya. And so that is the lineage that I hope to continue through my teaching, um, which is sort of the foundational work of yoga therapy. And they are hugely inspirational to me because like their teachers, they live the practice. So they have a strong personal practice. They live that set of values, that sort of deep connection to themselves, but also to the environment that they're in. And yeah, they're just very thoughtful about using all of the tools of yoga. So breath, meditation, visualization, chanting, like all of these things that Western yoga doesn't do um, are things that we offer. And so it's been really lovely to be able to learn more about all of those things. Yoga is a mixture of physical, mental, and emotional things. Absolutely. It is very much holistic, which is why sort of my Instagram handle is Holistic Yoga Therapist, because it's not just, oh, I'll give you an asana practice and send you on your way and everything will be fine. I have students who, like me, either deal with chronic pain or chronic fatigue, and for most of them, getting out of bed is not a possible thing many days. And so with them, sort of the work that we do is purely with the breath. And because your breath has an impact on your nervous system, over time through a dedicated practice, they end up feeling better. And then things like chanting and visualization are more accessible. And then uh, we build to eventually an asana practice. And even in an asana practice, if I have someone show up with like a shoulder injury, as an example, because I have a lot of shoulder injuries in my past history, you know, I wouldn't start with something aggressive. It would be sort of fairly gentle movements. All you might do is sort of, you know, lift your arm and bring it down until that felt comfortable. And then we proceed from there to, you know, developing the full range of motion. And once the full range of motion and flexibility is there, only then would I start to sort of put weight on the joint to to strengthen it. So yeah, it's a whole wonderful complex set of processes and each practice is designed custom for the person I'm working with. So I would never give two people the same practice because even if they show up with the same condition, everything else in their life is different. So before talking about the clients, I want to know how, uh, what is the change that happened in you? uh, uh, And tell me the effect, uh, uh, how you got affected because of yoga and uh, what is the change that you observed in yourself with yoga? Sure. Um, So as I mentioned, I live with chronic pain. I also used to live with disordered eating. So two things when you put them together, you know, everything already hurts and then you're not eating or you're eating poorly. And so then you already feel like garbage and everything just doesn't feel very good. Um, So my practice has very much not only restored my mobility from a set of injuries, but also means I have enough energy to get through every day. And it's a pretty long day, to be honest. You know, I start probably at 7.30 a.m. and I'm working till at least 7.30 p.m. So it's a 12-hour day of work. And then, you know, I have family and other things to deal with. But I have the energy to do that. And I'm not in pain. I'm sitting here talking to you and nothing hurts, which, you know, as a child, I couldn't imagine as a reality because everything hurt all the time. And that comes from my practice and from breathing mindfully, from movement every day, from, you know, oil application to all of my joints so they're hydrated and mobile. Um, So that like being pain free is something I couldn't imagine as a kid. And now I am, you know, 360 days of a year, which is pretty awesome in my opinion. And I have a much better relationship with my body and with food and everything just feels healthier. I'm not stressed about how many calories I'm eating or if I'm burning enough of them or if I'm, you know, whatever other stupid things we are told about our diets. It's nice just to be able to know how to eat for my constitution. Yoga and Ayurveda are very closely linked. And so that is sort of an eating pattern that's worked for me. But yeah, I feel better. I move better. I'm not stressed. And I can make space in my life to help other people, which I could, as a kid, I was like, I can't get out of bed. So this is huge. So what is your connection with the nature, your energy? Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, we are all energy. I, I live with a cat. I don't know if you've seen her on Instagram. She's, she's my fundamental connection to nature. But one of my favorite things in the world is just to go and stand like with bare feet on the earth, 
and you know just really really be in awe of all of the wonderful wonderful things that are out there over covid i live in a fairly small apartment and so i decided i was going to start to grow some things on my balcony because we weren't allowed to go outside and just watching those plants thrive in a world that seemed to be falling apart you know everything was different no one knew what was going to happen and these plants were like i'm just going to grow i have sunlight and i have dirt and i'm going to grow and that's enough and i was like if these plants can grow then i think everyone some in some shape or form will sort of find a way to keep going and to find growth whatever that looks like even through the tough spots and so yeah i like for me being in nature i mean i'm lucky to live in a place that has lots of wide open spaces lots of raw wild spaces just to sit and be in awe of all of it and to yeah just really absorb that i find helps build my resilience do all human beings have uh, the the same way of uh, thinking or uh, the, the same the same way of uh, i mean the mechanism in the body will be the same i'm sure uh, in uh, in your experience i'm sure you have uh, observed in a lot of your clients if on a fundamental level yes but how sort of the environment that we're in the things that we are taught change our perceptions of the world and so some of the work that i do is just helping people return to that understanding that ultimately we are all part of a greater whole a lot of the world tells us that you know you are separate you are unique the things that are happening to you only happen to you no one else has shared this experience and that in some ways really increases people's suffering because they don't feel like they have anyone to relate to they don't feel like it's a shared experience and that drives a lot of um sometimes quite destructive behavior and so through the practice and in connection with the self um once there is that sort of comfort in being in the body and in people people being in their own minds to be quite scary um, but also learning to be in their breath once they are better connected with themselves they're better able to see the similarities between themselves and other people between themselves and their environment and so that is sort of the longer term work it might not be the immediate work that i do with a student because you know they show up for shoulder pain or diabetes or pregnancy and they don't that's not what they're no one is showing up to be like help me connect with the universe naya i wish they were but they're usually not there yet um and so that's the longer term work so over time we might start to read philosophy together we might explore concepts from the yoga sutras a little bit more but the initial work is usually pain relief but everyone can get there so you treat people by knowing what problems that they have Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the reason the training is the equivalent of a master's degree worth of training is because we study all 12 systems of the body, how they work together. We explore condition by condition both from a western medical perspective, but also from an ayurvedic perspective and then from a yoga therapy perspective. So, as a yoga therapist, I can work with your physician, I can work with your chiropractor, with your physiotherapist, with your psychotherapist. So, whatever other healing you are doing, I would work in complement to that, not in opposition to because it's not helpful when you know one person says this and the other person says something completely different um but yes that is a lot of our work is working to support whatever people are dealing with whatever the condition is that they show up with and we work with like i work with the person that appears so you know if you walk in and you're like oh i have diabetes and my shoulder hurts and i have you know a hip injury i'm still going to work with you i'm not going to work with diabetes So the way western medicine would work, approach a condition as opposed to the person who has the condition I work with the person who has the condition so looking at all of the other things in their life as well. Uh you you understand people's negativity and uh, you you send your positive uh, uh, emotions and thoughts and feelings of yours into their uh, bodies right so tell me about uh, how you gain this positivity and where you are gaining I, I mean where what is what, what is your source <laughs> my service is my personal practice. I mean, and I'm also very lucky what this is something my teachers actually do is every night they and I can only imagine how they do this because there are so many of us. They actually when they meditate, they hold all of us in their meditation. And so for my own students, which are a much smaller number since I'm still building my practice, I do the same thing. So I'll sit and you know, I'll name each person, I'll visualize them. and in that small way sort of there's a little bit of energetic healing that happens 
And yeah, I mean, that's sort of been the bulk of my practice, but my personal practice, the fact that, you know, I move every day, I sit and I breathe, I chant, I meditate, I do all of these things, gives me energy. I eat well, I spend time with people I love, I spend time outside in the sunlight. All of those, you know, basic maintenance tools give me the energy and the capacity to do what I do every day. So you have spent a lot of time in studying this uh, subject, right? So uh, in your life, uh, have you ever thought that uh, uh, what is your connection with the nature? Why you are here in between other species? It's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I think about sort of where I'm located and all of the privilege that I have to do good in the world. Um, and I mean, do I have a good answer for you? I don't, I don't know. I think I'm here to, to help people feel better and whether that's, you know, helping them reorganize their lives or build new habits or develop a physical practice, like whatever that means, whether it's helping other yoga therapists start their own businesses without it being a hassle, just to help, yeah. Fundamentally, I knew as a kid I wanted to help people feel better, and you know I thought that meant being a doctor. I was wrong. That's not what it meant at all. Um, but yeah, just bringing that sense of ease and comfort so that people aren't don't feel bad and then don't you know aren't angry and don't take that out on the world in really unpleasant ways. I think is why I'm here. It's always kind of been that way. So tell me about the types of uh, things that you observe in people and uh, in their, uh, it can be emotion, emotional or uh, mental or intelligence level or intellectual level. So what is what you observe and what, uh, any, any particular examples that you never forget? That's an interesting one. Um, I did my thesis actually on the yoga therapeutic approach to obesity, which is you know a fairly common rampant world, worldwide problem. And obesity rates have only been going up um, since sort of the 70s, which is a bit odd when you think about it, because before that, you know, no one was really that obese and it wasn't like a massive global crisis. And it's been interesting to observe how people have been told things about their health that maybe we've become less critical thinkers of, or people are just less educated and this is not an individual thing it's more sort of a social thing where people are conditioned not to critically address information and they just sort of believe it so when doctors told us don't eat egg yolks we stopped eating egg yolks and then they said don't eat butter so we stopped eating butter and we started eating all this like terrible processed food which has you know significantly increased rates of obesity around the world it's not a sort of western problem anymore and so that's been really interesting to observe how systems like fundamental like the economic systems, capitalism, industrialization, all of these things combined with systems of oppression. So racism that tells you, oh, the food from your culture, if it's not, you know, white and Western is not good. It's not healthy for you to eat these traditional foods that your people have been eating for you know, centuries, right? Um, to see the impact that's had on people's health and the way they think about themselves and the way they think about their culture and then how they engage with other people. So that's been really interesting to me because fundamentally, if you don't have that sort of grounded relationship in food, often that comes from a culture that you are from and that your genetics are used to, then you see all these really negative outcomes. So it's less about, for me, the individual and more about sort of what we've been told in an effort to generate profits for a few people that it really bothers me in terms of healthcare. So it seems you have a lot of experience in this. Tell me about... Uh... Uh, the yoga effect and relationships? Hey, yoga is fundamentally about relationship, right? Like people people say the, the, the root word, like yoga, yoga means to, to yoke or to tie together, um, which is, I mean, it's an interesting sort of translation. The way my teachers explain it, yoga is to be in relationship with something. So you're putting sort of two or more things together, but it's about how they are together, not just about connecting them arbitrarily. Um, that is the work of yoga. So it's being sort of in positive alignment with something and not in that like white Western sort of hippie, everything is positive, good vibes only kind of way. That's not what I mean at all. Um, but yeah, being in yoga is, is being in relationship with someone from a place where if, you know, if that is something that is positive, then you are able to encourage it and to help it grow. And if it's negative, you can either sort of gently offer something corrective to guide 
you know, whether it's a person or an organization or a whole society back onto a path that is more aligned with being sort of energetically with the universe as opposed to harmful to the universe. And if it is not something then you could, that you can fix, because there are things that, you know, as individuals, we might not be able to correct, then you are able to sort of sit with that, but not to be reactive to it, which then also helps you maintain a balanced nervous system so you can move on and do other good work. So yeah, being able to cultivate that sense of, in some ways like Buddhist non-attachment, right? You're not driven by desire, you're not driven by suffering, you're able to flow comfortably between both is that sense of being in relationship. Uh, can yoga uh, increase the age of uh, a human being? <laughs> My teachers say yes. I, and I, I believe if you have a dedicated practice and you, you stick with it, so it requires both sort of willpower and really, really good habits, which you can build, it's completely possible, then yes, we have seen yoga increase the lifespan of many people. I might, when I started my therapy program, my teacher was joking. They were just like, if you start now, like if you start your practice now in sort of your late 20s, early 30s, you should be able to live comfortably to 120, you know, without pain, without fatigue. You should still be mobile. You should still be able to do everything you want to do. I personally don't know that I'm going to live to be 120, but it's entirely possible. So I'm sure uh, while doing your exercise, uh you might have experienced a lot of imaginations that are not there in the real world. Will you connect with that? I don't know that they're not, I mean, they might not currently exist in the real world, but they're all things that can be created. And that's sort of one of my favorite parts of doing um, things like Yoga Nidra, which is sort of a deep body scan where you go through, in yoga, we believe there are five layers of the constitution, sort of your very physical layer, the energetic layer, and it gets progressively deeper till you get to sort of this, this universal state of consciousness, as it were, the part of you that is already energetically part of the universe, and the part that ideally you can access when you're when you're asleep. Um, and so we try to access that from a slightly more wakeful place. And it's interesting for me to observe sort of what comes up there and what you know wonderful new ideas spring from that place. And they're all, I mean, in yoga philosophy, we believe sort of all of this is either things, seeds that have been planted in your past lives or, you know, things that you are sort of here to do in the world. Um, so being able to access that, I think, is pretty cool. I'm still working on it. It's, it's a newer practice for me. So I can't say I know all of the things just yet, but it's really fascinating to observe and be in that space. So in your experience, have you ever thought that why human body needs mind? What is the connection between mind and body? I think it's a fascinating question. Um, I mean, in sort of yoga philosophy, these are all intri like intrinsic parts of the self. The mind is, I mean, without the mind, you wouldn't be able to do very many things. Your universal consciousness is not thinking about keeping you fed, is not thinking about sort of, you know, making sure the temperature in the environment is right. Your universal consciousness is just there the same way other consciousness is there. And so the mind plays a pretty, pretty active role and a pretty, in some ways, a very valid role, so long as it's sort of directed well. So being able to sort of focus, um, and that includes sort of calming the nervous system so then you can actually pay attention to the things that matter and you're not distracted the way, you know, dogs are distracted by squirrels, by shiny objects, um, makes a big difference. So yeah, I think the body needs the mind so that the body doesn't fall apart because in and of itself, you're not, it's not going to be like, oh yes, I should, you know, seek shelter. It's going to be like, oh, it's nice and warm to lie in the sun and then you have a sunburn. <laughs> so yeah, that sort of next step thinking, what differentiates us from many animals that's not purely instinctive, but, you know, future planning and then sort of building in, in many ways, you know, keeps us safe and enables us to do really, I mean, sometimes really terrible things in the world, but often really good things. Uh, yoga means uh, world is in my mind. Um, I mean, that is what possible translation of it. It, it, you could interpret it as sort of, you know, the world that I perceive exists within me, which is true if you are the same, if you believe that you are the same universal energy as everything else. So, yeah, that is definitely one one type of translation. The one that I tend to go with is sort of yoga is fundamentally about being in relationship. So whether that relationship is between things in my mind or between things 
that you know I perceive as a physical being and that seem to be other physical things. Either way, it's true. Yeah. And uh, why uh, one person's uh, senses uh, uh, collected information doesn't match with uh, other person's senses collected information, which is, which is stored that's in such, the mind. That's such a great question. <laughs> That's always sort of been one of those things as a kid I wondered about where I was like, you know, if I taste this piece of fruit, does it taste the same to someone else? Does the color blue look the same to me as it does to someone else? And we know that's not true, right? If you're colorblind, what I see is very different than what you see. And, you know, that's within the same species. Like I can see color. My cat can only see black and white, but she sees things that move far faster than I would ever see them. So perception is is a fascinating thing and whether it's visual perception or sort of oral perception i don't know the why to be honest i don't know why things are different i imagine on some level there's you know a genetic or cellular difference that makes a difference um you know some people have more taste buds on their tongue so they taste more things than the rest of us do um yeah i'm not sure why people perceive things differently but i know it definitely adds color to the world and when my students appear i know it definitely teaches me more about sort of the breadth of experience where especially for students who are quite sort of engaged with their nervous systems the levels of sensitivity are much much higher so like the pressure of air on their skin can be painful which doesn't occur to me because it doesn't hurt for me and so it's really wonderful just to learn more about how people experience the world so have you ever compared uh, human beings with other species and uh, like you are expert in observing and uh, uh, you know understanding this mechanism this uh, mindsets and uh, like emotional thing everything so have you ever tried to compare uh, human beings with other species and do you think that do you believe that other species also have some exercise like yoga I mean, I do a lot of, I live with a cat, so I do a lot of comparison between me and my cat. And I like to joke that she is sort of the best yogi I have ever met because she's very connected to the present moment, which is a lot of the work of yoga is being sort of that non-attachment piece. And then being here and now with whatever is happening here and now, so not either thinking about what happened before, not thinking about what will happen next, but just like really being in your current experience. And most animals are in their current experience. They're not thinking about what happened yesterday and they're not planning for you know, their next meal or what's happening tomorrow. They're just here. And so I like to joke that my cat is probably the best yogi I've ever met because she eats when she's hungry, she sleeps when she's tired, she plays when she wants to play, which I wish, like, I wish more of my students were able to do that because I think they would definitely feel better because they would be responding to what they actually need in the world as opposed to what other people have told them they need. Um, do I think they have their own yoga? I think animals, I've, plants and animals, both are fundamentally sort of in relationship with everything in their environments. Are they consciously in relationship? I don't know. And I would love for someone to write a paper about it or tell me more about it. But I think on an innate level, they know that they exist in an environment. And so they are in relationship with it in a way that humans sometimes forget. We like to think we're the top of everything and we control everything. I know that my cat sort of understands that she doesn't control everything because otherwise she'd get food whenever she wanted. So what, uh, what is human being before yoga and after yoga? Human being before yoga for most of my students and I think for most people is disconnected. That sense of, you know, aloneness, I am separate, I, you know, no one understands what it's like to be me. And after yoga, I think we are better connected and not in like the, oh, I have a smartphone and I can connect with the whole world kind of connected, but that sort of deeper, more fundamental understanding that, you know, we are all the same universal energy and sort of the things that I do impact everything around me, the things that other people do impact me. And so it's helpful to sort of be that like supportive energetic space as opposed to being closed or negative or otherwise disruptive to good things. Can I say uh, yoga uh, helps in uh, increasing the observation power and absorption power? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, a lot of the work we do in yoga is about ultimately 
like after sort of the therapy part of yoga is done because we are as a therapist you know we're there to solve problems but once you can sit comfortably once you're in good relationship with yourself and the universe then you can really start to focus because all of those things that would take up all the space in your head are dealt with so then yeah you can deepen your you know your exploration into yourself or into the universe that's when you really start to get into those like really beautiful philosophical problems that man has been thinking about since the beginning of time so yeah once i mean the goal i like to joke with my students because they show up and they're like oh what do you mean i don't have an hour-long asana practice who has time anymore like who can really do an hour-long asana practice it's like the goal of your physical practice is so you can sit and meditate and think about those big universal questions and be in connection with sort of, you know, what is the meaning of life? Yeah, so absolutely increases focus, increases observation in the, maybe not in the immediate term, but in the longer term. So who created yoga? Hey, that's an interesting question. I can tell you who documented it. <laughs> but I can't tell you off the top of my head who created it. Um, some very, very smart people for sure who have done a lot of their own observational work and a lot of their own practice and then, you know, either passed it down through oral tradition, eventually wrote it down. So the rest of us sort of have this wonderful gift to be able to share with the world. I cannot pinpoint the first creator, but in sort of my tradition, the Vedas inform a lot of our work the Yoga Sutras, the Patanjali's Yoga Sutras are sort of the first documented texts that we use um, in terms of sort of the historical aspect of yoga. And then in my lineage, the work of, you know, Sri Krishnamacharya is what informs a lot of what we do. But did they create yoga? No, that came from somewhere else. That came from someone else whose name, unfortunately, is uh, not known to me. And I don't know that it's known to really very many people. But I'm very grateful for all of their work. So tell me how much time you spend in uh, collecting uh, this information and understanding about uh, everything related to yoga. Oh, man. Um, I mean, I can sort of tell you hours of training, which are now sort of upwards of 1500. And that's just formal, like sit in a class and learn from someone training or work with a student and learn from someone. But outside of that, in my personal practice, it's also sort of thousands of hours. I've been practicing since I was 13. And I'm almost 35. So, you know, it's that many years of maybe not every day sitting and thinking and learning, but sort of in the back of my head or otherwise processing. And it, I'm not done either. Like this is, I'm just starting this work. It's a lifetime ahead of me of sort of learning and diving deeper into things and exploring and maybe doing research one day. Who knows? But yeah, it is the work of a lifetime. So what is a common thing that you observe in your clients? I observe a few things. Most people don't know how to breathe. And I know that sounds a little bit nuts because everyone is alive. And so you're just like, what do you mean they don't know how to breathe? Um, most people either breathe through their mouths or don't breathe properly through their noses. And so a lot of my initial work with someone is teaching them how to breathe properly. And that automatically improves how they sleep. It changes their energy levels. It often helps with their digestion. And once you fix sort of those fundamental system problems, then everything else gets better. So yeah, that's the one thing I've observed, especially here in the West. Um, I'm, I'm in Canada right now. Over COVID, allergy levels have gone up, asthma has gone up. Like people just aren't breathing well and not because of like, they didn't all get COVID. COVID is its own set of respiratory issues. But yeah, fixing how people breathe, I think is gonna be the work of my life because once we do that, everything else gets better. And then after that, it's fixing how people eat and not fixing because it's wrong or incorrect, but just sort of guiding them back to a place where they're eating things that are good for them as opposed to things that were produced in a factory, to be honest. Um, both of those things fundamentally will make all, everything else a lot better. So where does uh, uh, imagination is coming from? All these thoughts and all this uh, uh, energy, where, where, where? Uh, where human is collecting? I, that's an interesting question. I mean, we there is that sense that, at least in yoga, there is a universal consciousness. So all this wisdom is sort of held collectively. And in theory, if you work at it, anyone can access it. It's just a matter of sitting with the right teacher and finding the path that is for you to be able to tap into this. Um, and I'm really lucky to have found teachers that 
align with me and that I'm comfortable learning from and who are sort of comfortable letting me work at a pace that makes sense and, you know, letting me make mistakes and learning from those. Um, yeah, there's, there's an understanding, at least in yoga and also like in Jungian psychology and sort of other Western traditions of sort of a larger collective unconscious where all of this information is held, just waiting for us to tap into it. So as a person who understands energy, I, I'm sure uh, you might have uh, heard and understood about uh, Big Bang Theory. Right. So you are expert in understanding the energy in human beings, right? So do you agree with that? And uh, do you think that uh, this yoga created when that energy was created? <laughs> I, the practice of yoga as it's codified is probably, wasn't probably codified at the time of the Big Bang. But yeah, ultimately we are, we are universal energy, right? So that first spark of life is the spark of life that exists in us until it leaves us. And then, you know, the body is just a body. It's why fundamentally as a yoga therapist, I don't work with the body. I work with the energy within the body. And so, yeah, that energy ostensibly came from somewhere and why not the Big Bang? Where, like, where else would it have come from? So I'm sure in this, uh, from 13 to 35, in this, in this long uh, experience, uh, I'm sure you might have experienced the, 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 the top layer, uh, the, the top layer of uh, consciousness. So when you reach that, have you ever thought that, uh, you know, I know the species which created this universe. <laughs> No, I can't say I've had that experience. I mean, I have a lot of work to do to spend lots of time in that space. So maybe one day I'll arrive at that understanding. I mean, for me, achieving that level of consciousness is momentary, right? There's those, you know, 10, 15 seconds, if I'm lucky, of like accessing that, that lovely, lovely space. And for me, it feels like coming home. I don't know that it feels that way for everyone. That's my perception of it. Um, and I don't know that when I'm there, I'm driven by sort of questions of who created the universe. It's just like, oh, I'm home. I just want to be here. I just want to relax into this space and sort of, you know, let everything settle as opposed to I need answers to all of the things. It's less it's less a driven space and more of a relaxing space for me. But next time I'm there, I'll see if I can figure it out for you. So one last question is, uh, you know, we have... Uh... Um, I, I asked uh, questions which are about the planet. I'll ask uh, the questions which are into the planet. So people come to you and ask the, you know, come with uh, the mental and the physical uh, and the emotional illness, right? You tell them what works for them. So I'm sure uh, you observe them very deeper in, in all the levels. So living in this social world and uh, having listening to all the same problems from different people, you know, and how how you feel personally? I mean, there are days when I'm very sad, right? Like there are days where, yeah, you're right. I see the same thing. I see, you know, really terrible health outcomes from industrialized systems. I see terrible health outcomes from histories of white supremacy, racialization, oppression. Things were, you know, if people were just nicer to each other and less driven by power and greed and the need to hold everything because they feel like they're alone in the world would be better. And yeah, so there are days where I'm, I'm quite sad, but there, are, it doesn't matter how sad I am because all of my students, regardless of what they show up with, whether, you know, it's palliative care or pregnancy or, you know, I hurt my knee, all of them have capacity to heal themselves. And that's why I'm able to keep going as a yoga therapist, because there is never, I've never had a student show up where I was like, there's nothing we can do. Even if, you know, they're like stage four cancer, they have six months to live, we can still work together to create a sense of ease and a sense of comfort and a sense of connection so that they can, I mean, in that case, pass peacefully without agitation and without sort of a significant amount of suffering. And so everyone has that capacity within themselves. It takes it takes some willpower. It takes some effort. It's not magical or easy. But, you know, even on days where I'm super sad about the, you know, the broader state of the world and our broken systems and the fact that, you know, people are food insecure and poverty is rampant and, like, these are all problems that we can fix. As individuals, everyone has this deep, deep capacity for healing. And, yeah, that's that's what makes me get up every morning and, you know, show up and help my students because I know they can do this. They've proven it to me. Now they just have to prove it to themselves. 
so so you understand uh, what people are feeling and what they are into and you give yeah. medicine to them yeah i mean it's it's not medicine in the western sense often it's you know here's how you breathe through your nose and here's how you can use you know oil application to make your joints hurt less and here are some foods you might want to consider removing from your diet or foods you might want to add to your diet so it's pretty simple stuff it's very rare that i'm like here's a long complicated solution it's like you know maybe move for 5 minutes a day maybe get some sunlight but it's those little things done consistently over time that fundamentally change quality of life so yeah every solution is custom designed for whatever people show up with but also for what their goals are right i can see six pregnant people and all of them want different things one of them wants pain free childbirth one of them just wants a healthy pregnancy one of them has had you know multiple children and doesn't want postpartum depression it's different every time for every person so yeah a lot of my work is custom but i love that i love that problem solving so at last do you have anything to say to the world and uh, the energy which is consuming you right now hey thank you for for the opportunity to do the things that I do as a kid I didn't imagine a world where I would be a yoga therapist like I didn't even know that was a career that existed so you know I'm grateful for a world where that's a thing I'm grateful for people who are willing to try yoga therapy most people are like oh do we just sit in child's pose and cry no that's not what we do it's not it's not talk therapy but yeah no i'm just so grateful to be in the world and to do this work and have people who are willing to try it and share their experiences with me so that i can tell those people tell those things to the rest of the world and hopefully we get you know everyone who is suffering to try this in some shape or form so that they can feel better so uh, the last one i forgot to ask this uh, so what is the uh, what is the energy that you got uh, after uh, you putting your energy on on the energies it tends to be a positive return like i don't ever feel depleted from the work that i do i've always left a session feeling energized sometimes it's difficult to sit especially with students you know in palliative care or with chronic conditions but putting energy out never feels depleting for me it always feels really restorative because when you hold on to things they just congeal and they stick and it's just it's not fun or comfortable energy has to move right if you don't move energy then what's the point like and this is true for money which is also a form of energy it's true for really everything so yeah putting stuff out into the world makes me feel better not worse and i always get more back than i put out so so can you tell uh, people uh, uh, you're from toronto so mm. there are a lot of people who will be watching uh, from canada or listening to this from canada from different parts so how how they can connect with you how can they get uh, uh, you know your service i mean people globally can access my service now especially thanks to covid everyone sort of understands how to use zoom or some sort of communications platform so i'm not limited to working in canada i'm happy to work globally so whether you know you're in turkey or australia or really wherever so i only speak english that is my limitation um, so if english is not your first language it will be a little bit harder for us to work together but otherwise it doesn't matter where in the world you are i'm happy happy to meet you happy to work with you um you can find me on the internet my website is www.nblife.ca or on instagram at holistic yoga therapist So either of those spaces feel free to reach out. I mean my name is also not that common. So if you google Naya Bajaj yoga therapy I will pop up. There's I'm pretty sure I'm the only one. Awesome. I'll put uh, all your uh, links in the description of this video. People who finds our video can uh, find your links and can connect with you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you making space for this conversation for this fairly new profession. So At last have you seen any videos of mine on YouTube? I did. When you connected with me, I looked them up and I was so engaged with the diversity of people that you speak to. I was a little bit mind blown to be honest. So, as a energy generator, as a person who observes uh, the negativity and sends positivity into the bodies, what do you say about uh, the energy that uh, you observe in on my YouTube channel or or on my website or anywhere so that you saw with your senses
Oh, it was super positive. Like so many people were so excited. I love that. I love seeing these like wonderful collections of stories where people feel really comfortable sharing about things too. It wasn't just like, here's my 30 second elevator pitch that I've designed so that, you know, there's no feeling in it. And I talk like a robot. Um, no, I loved it. It was so positive. People were so excited. And thank you for making space for people to share their passion with the world. It's really important work. So uh, I, I got a job in Canada, uh, in Toronto. <laughs> so maybe in one and a half or two months, maybe. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'll, I'll come and uh, if possible, I'll 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 uh, take your service and uh, I will take your interview directly and uh, I will tell my audience again the effect that I got. Oh my God! Absolutely! Congratulations and you know early welcome to Canada and to Toronto. If you need anything at all, please reach out. We're yeah. so lucky to have you. You know, uh, Canadians uh, liked my work and. Uh, and uh, offered me a job and I'm very thankful that I'm coming to the, the very beautiful, uh, the, the, the very nature related country. So I love, it. as an IT director, I got uh, an opportunity. So I'm thankful for them and thankful for you. Uh, and uh, not only that, Indians will know the work that you are doing and at the same time, the answers that you give creates a lot of positive energy to the people who are here, so, uh, not only here, from anywhere on this planet, you know, they can understand where you're coming from and uh, what uh, the effect that they are going to feel uh, if they connect with you. I'm sure uh, it will be 100% positive. <laughs> yeah, so, I'm looking forward to it. And the work is the work is universal, right? We are the same energy regardless of where in the world we are or who we are. So yeah, no, but I'm so excited that you're coming. That's awesome news. So at last, can I put this audio and video clip on my YouTube channel with your permission? Absolutely. And if you need anything else from me, just let me know. Yeah, and also on my social media, internet podcast website, everywhere I'll put with yeah. your permission. Can I do that? Please do. The further the word spreads, the more people know that yoga therapists exist and we are there to help them, the happier I will be. Definitely. And uh, is there any uh, consultation? I mean, uh, if they want to, uh, everything is there in your website, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They can book a free consult. They can book a set of sessions. They can just reach out to me and say, I don't know what I want yet. Can we just like email for a little bit? Absolutely. I am open to however people would like to get in touch. Yeah, thank you very much again for giving me opportunity to talk with you and uh, allowing me to ask you a few questions. Thank you for making time and space for me to tell this story. I'm so grateful. Yeah, take care and keep going, keep doing what you love. Thank you, you too. It makes a big difference in the world. Thank you. Bye. Bye.